Welcome to the Business Dialogues online discussion in partnership with the Kisby SME Fund. My name is Nastasia Aronsa and throughout this session we're going to be looking at various aspects of the SME landscape. We're also going to be talking about the exciting launch of the Kisby SME Fund which is a new innovative uh, fund that is uh, basically concepted all around South Africa and it is aimed at helping entrepreneurs get funding and we're going to get more information about it throughout the discussion. But I kind of have the discussion alone and we figured in order to have something that is more robust and you can enjoy and get some valuable insights, I'd like to introduce you to my panelists that is uh, starting off with Mark Barnes who is the executive chair of the Kisby SME Fund and then of course we have Fatima Vauda who is the managing director of 27.4 Investment Managers. We have Sean Emery, who is the CEO and co-founder of Rainfin, and Andila Kamala, CEO of Kamala & Co. Thank you so much uh, for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for your interest. So the one thing that everyone has been talking about, um, of course, is the coronavirus and the fact that it's having devastating um, impact on various uh, parts of businesses and in particular people's lives. And what we're also seeing is that as more economies begin to navigate their way through this new world that we find ourselves in, and in some cases, re-entering various levels of the lockdown, we're gonna see unintended consequences that will have an effect on small businesses, have an effect on workers. And let's start off with you, Andile, because you have been talking about the SME landscape for as long as I think most people have been following your entrepreneurial journey. Give us an assessment as to what the lay of the land is right now for from some of the uh, entrepreneurs as you may have caught up with. Thank you very much, Tash. Yes, indeed, it is uh, tough times for, I guess, both workers and also business owners, big and small. Uh, I do think that COVID-19 presents a specific challenge in just the restrictions that didn't exist before. Um, and now small businesses having to navigate, trying to stay alive, trying to continue trading in an environment that's extremely restrictive. But in the context of South Africa, of course, um, Fatima will tell you, watches the markets closer. We are already in a difficult time as an economy. Our economy was already uh, growing way too slow. In fact, if anything, probably in real terms, uh, retracting and not growing at all. So we, we've got this kind of once in a lifetime event affecting us in an environment where we're already in a little bit of a trough. And I think that it's gonna take a lot um, for small business owners to get through it. My, my own views is that we have to accept that many, many, many will shut down, which will mean that many more will, will leave the economy and no longer be productive in the economy. And if ever there was a time we needed more people in the economy, it was now because already South Africa is sitting with more people on social grants than employed. Already South Africa is sitting with probably 40, 50 percent of its potential workforce at home having given up uh, looking for work. So. We absolutely need to think out of the box about finding solutions to support small businesses. And I guess that's why we're here this morning. Right, and I see uh, Fatima agreeing with some of the points that you're raising there. And we're starting to see some questions come through as well on screen. And we'll get to that Q&A session a little bit later on. I'll be monitoring it on my side via the live chat. But Fatima, let's come to you. I mean, um, Andile was mentioning some of the key elements, some of the key concerns. What's your view at this point? Now, coming into 2020, uh, we actually thought we'd begin to see some form of an economic recovery because uh, uh, we're putting policies in place that would help us uh, unlock of the economy. And then COVID-19 happened, um, and we've basically uh, gone back 10,000 steps. Uh, the result for SMMEs has been devastating. I mean, in many cases, I mean, Stacks has seen some numbers uh, recently which demonstrates that at the end of July, most SMMEs in South Africa will not be able to carry on beyond that. We expect in excess of 500,000 jobs um, to be lost uh, in the SMME space as a direct result of COVID. So this is a critically uh, serious situation where we've got to come back, come to the table as stakeholders and find solutions And the KISB Fund that we are talking about today it's a clear demonstration of a collective effort to come together and say, you know what, we've got a critical challenge and we've got to resolve it. Increased unemployment is not going to stay an economic recovery. And people who only invest in investment 
where they think that this is mutually exclusive. It is not mutually exclusive because with higher rates of unemployment, it's eventually going to impact everything else. And if your money is currently sitting in NASPA, it's going to impact NASPA. Mark, let's uh, come to you. I mean, we have um, a national blueprint uh, known as the National Development Plan, and it has the idea that by 2020, or rather 2030, we should be creating at least 70% of employment coming from the small business sector, being generated by the small business sector. And taking into account what Andil has described, what Fatima has described, and various other things even before COVID, we're not anywhere close to reaching that target, at least from where I'm sitting and where I'm analyzing the numbers. Where do you begin as a business to try and rebuild some level of um, adjustment to get to whatever happens beyond this, uh, beyond COVID, so to speak? Yeah, thanks. You know, I think, first of all, we need to get out of our comfort zones, you know, and we, get, we need to move out of writing documents in, in in good places and get down to where the action is. Okay, and 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 the solution lies in a combination of things. And the first com the first thing you need to do is be willing to take an appropriate risk capital equation into account. And and, and I think that that we bring together here two very different aspects as far as SME funding is concerned. First of all, we've got the right capital mix and the attitude that drives that. And second of all. We think beyond any particular asset into a community of SMEs and how that ecosystem can be, uh, you know, mutually uh, helpful in, in creating a new economy. And so, you know, to talk about the point of employment, it's not neutral, man. If, if we've got someone employed, that's an asset to the economy, an asset to the country. They pay tax, they send kids to school, they eat food, they do it. If we've got someone who's unemployed, that's a liability uh, to the country. And, uh, you know, and Ndili talked about social grants. We are not looking at social development in this country. We're looking at social rescue. Okay, and there's a fundamental difference. And so we need to go into uh, the, the, the energy, the, the, the lifeblood of the economy and move away from established mature capital markets into the reality of our own country. Right. Speaking of which, uh, Sean, let's get to you. I mean, with your experience at uh, Rainfin, where do we get to, when rather do we get to a point where we have the financial sector stimulating the kind of growth we need from the, the small business side? Good morning, everybody. Thanks, thanks for having us today. And I mean, Mark touched on the point as well. As you know, we've been working for a long time in Rainfin in injecting capital into the SME market. And what's very interesting is we're now seeing a significant shift in the attitude of institutional capital in South Africa. And it's, and it's welcome to see. People are realizing that they need to take that institutional capital away from what Mark calls the circle of capitalism, which is basically sitting in the top of the Santon Towers and in those huge organizations where it feels safe. Take some of that money and put it into what we call the aspirant capital. So Mark, so I'm going to use his bad word, which is aspirant capital needs to meet institutional capital. And we're seeing that. We're seeing development agencies wanting to come in contact with and work together with institutional fund money. And now you've got this blend that we talk about. And because on their own, they're never going to be capable of, work, of solving this problem. But if we can take developmental capital, institutional capital, pull those together, it means a better product for an SME. And when we look at this problem from an SME's point of view, they want growth capital. They don't want stifling high interest rate exploitative capital. Unfortunately, if you don't have institutions and development agencies working together to solve the problem, you are going to get a little bit of that exploitative capital taking advantage of the stress that's out there at the moment. Which then uh, takes a nice segue into um, the next question, which I have for you, Mark. And let's talk a little bit more about the SME, uh, the KISB fund. What is it about and how did you um, get involved in it? Because the last time people, you know, spoke or even heard from you, you were at uh, Postbank. Yeah, uh, that was a long, long time ago. I don't know why you have to dig up the past like that. <laughs> History matters. It creates context, yet, Mark. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because I went to the post office not to solve post, but to utilize a commercially irreplaceable infrastructure 
to connect to the people of South Africa in the informal economy. And we happened there to have the most extraordinary footprint in, in, in the country. And we could use that for everything. We could use it through post-bank to bank the unbanked. We could use it, we could use it to distribute antiretrovirals. We could use it to uh, you know, filter out and, and, and deliver e-commerce. And so I went there to, to utilize, to leverage up an, uh, you know, uh, the capacity of the state and create a direct you know, access point uh, um, between the people in the rural areas and the central economy. So that was the reason I went there, and the rest is, 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 is history. Uh, what am I doing here now? I've been wanting to do this for the last decade or more. Okay. Uh, I've been wanting to find a collection, and, and I was invited uh, into this group, and, and this is an extraordinary mix. Okay. What you need today is you need to make full use of technology, first point. And so today's modern technology allows filtering and oversight of, uh, of lending practices and, 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 and you know, loan applications, which was, which was previously not available to us. And I'll give you an example, last reference to the post office. When I was in China with the other CEOs of post offices around the world, and we looked at a model where they were able to lend people in any part of China money to do their business. And if you were buying apples, they put money into your account only to buy apples. That's the only thing you could do. And then you sold the apples in the afternoon and they cleared out your account in the morning. But you could buy as many apples as you like because the oversight, the technology enabled them to control the flow of funds without having to check whether you're a nice person or whether you've got assets at home or whether you're uncle. So we needed technology. We, having this thing, we have, uh, you know, 4AX debt services, which is an up and running valid you know, uh, operating entity, which is our first filter. So we're using technology and we'll use technology to oversee where the loans go. But that's not enough. You actually then need to have, uh, you know, equity expertise in the same in the same basket. And the, the key differentiator for us is that we're going to have a mixture of debt and equity instruments, which takes cognizance of where you are in your growth profile. There are going to be some fast growing companies that don't need debt to hold them back. They're going to be some more predictable companies, which may have been affected by COVID, but when they're back on stream, they have a far more mature cash profile. They don't need equity as much as they need just funding to get back to their predictable economic models. We have the capacity and the experience within this group of people to assess that and to apply it. Okay. And when you stand back from that, you'll find that we have a portfolio of SMEs, which has a mix, we think, roughly 20% equity and 80% and debt at affordable rates. Even our debt, our senior secured debt element of our funding is 5, 6, 7% below the cheapest rate that you can get out on the street. And I, I, I'll tell you why. If you just lend money to people, you either get it back, but you don't get invited to the party when they succeed, or you don't get it back, in which case you get... Uh, you know, affected by that uh, outcome, and you have to e keep increasing the price of debt capital. And that's where we've got to. People are, are, are you know, borrowing money at 40%. There isn't an asset that yields 40%. You can't borrow money. Credit at SME level has become a, a destroyer, not an enabler. We are looking at an appropriate mix of affordable capital to grow those little businesses. Fatima, I see you're agreeing with Mark there. Then is that the what we've been missing uh, all along, where you have um, a, a nice mix of equity and debt. And I suppose as somebody who's a funder, you're coming to the table as more than just somebody who's funding. You're coming to the table as somebody who is now uh, involved in a partnership in this journey with the entrepreneur and you're helping them with more than just money. Is that what was missing here all along? Yeah, I mean, I want to, um, I want to speak to a couple of things. I mean, uh, uh, both Mark and Sean have raised a range of issues we, uh, which are fundamentally important. I mean, the one thing we definitely know is that um, the traditional banking system in South Africa is not supportive of SMME financing. Uh, they cannot finance SMMEs because they cre their current credit rating models and management models, et cetera, are not designed for the SMME. They also do not have the right technology to be able to deal with excessive applications that are lower down the pyramid, which is when Sean comes in. Um, and Mark raises some very, very important issues. Uh, where I come in is really from 
thinking about the blended finance perspective. Uh, these things cannot be achieved on their own. Um, currently, governments come to the party from, from a perspective of credit, but it's not credit guarantees, etc. but it's not enough. What this market desperately needed was an innovative mechanism and an innovative solution to bring all of it together. So you've got to bring the fintech together. You've got to bring the support structure to, together. You've got to bring external investors together. And you've got to create a solution that can deal with the current gaps in the market. And I'm convinced that the current solution that's being put on the table is a solution that brings all of it together and is unique to the current, uh, what is currently available in the market. It's going to tackle and deal with the challenges that we're facing in this space. And at the end of the day, we've got to reflect back that South Africa is an emerging and a developing economy. We cannot operate on the same rules as um, the large developed world economies. Um, and if you just think back about all the capital that is chasing so few investments in South Africa, I'll give you an example. You know, just 10 years ago, the JSE had over 600 shares listed on the exchange. Today, we're sitting with around 300, where only 60 counters are really liquid. In fact, the rest of the JSE is, is not gaining any traction. And in fact, those discounts continue to widen. Capital chasing limited amount of investments and also, the, 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 the large counters of the JSC have taken their money and invested the, that money offshore for years now in failed investments. We estimate that close to 200 billion rand has been invested offshore and not generated any value to local shareholders. Can you imagine if that money was plugged into the SME market that can fuel economic growth, that can fuel job creation? I mean, what would we, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. And delay your thoughts? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more with Fatima and, and what Mark was saying. You know, one of the big conversations that have been happening in the past decade and a bit um, in business in general is this thing, Tash, of impact investing. And, you know, we have this conversation in like this very intelligent way. I mean, the long and short is we need capital to play its fundamental role. And what's the role of capital, right? It can't be to make a return because you can enjoy your return all you want. If you've got, a, if you've got a, um, a, an environment that continues to, to be destroyed, where are you going to enjoy your returns? If you're living in a country where half the population is destitute and has no real reason to get up every morning, how are you going to enjoy your returns? So we really have to flip. I, th I think what we're doing here at Kisby is we're trying to flip the question of what is a real impact investment return? What is the return that gives you good returns financially but also helps the country go forward? And for me, it has to be about something of uh, something that allows the, as many South Africans as possible to be contributors to the economy, what Mark calls assets to the economy. Because if I'm employed or I'm engaged, whether I'm at a full-time job, a part-time job, or I'm an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm an asset to the economy. I pay taxes, I, I, I pay rates, I take people to school, I, I buy clothes, I buy food, I own a property. I do all of those things because I'm a productive member of society. So for me, the capital for me is a no-brainer. And, and I, I, I hope that the people that will be listening to my colleagues as they go around the country and the world doing the roadshow of getting capital, I hope the penny drops even before they walk in. Because what else are you doing with your money if you're not investing in, in trying to get the country where it ought to be? For me, though, a big element of our fund, Tash, just to add to the different elements, will have to be the support to the entrepreneurs. In my personal view, the big reason why many can't get the funding. Because you talk to any entrepreneur, they'll tell you, ah, we keep hearing about these funds. Everyone says they're giving funding until you apply. A couple of simple things that just are never done. One, when you decline an application, no one tells you why you can get the money. All you get is a no. So you never quite know what to fix so that you can go back. Number two, how many applications fail perhaps because of one or two missing things, right? But a fail is a fail. It's a black and white issue. It's a switch on, switch off. There's a lot of amber clients or gray area, which needs support in order to kind of, you know, graduate into an approval. We have to do that. Otherwise, we'll be like everybody else. You will apply through a platform and you get an A or A cheers. We're only interested in the guys that are already coming, quote unquote, ready to go. The, the, the reality is that we live in South Africa. The majority of the entrepreneurs are going to be black. Because they are black, they come with historical issues and baggage. Part of that is the skills 
to submit and put forward a credible application. That doesn't mean they're not deserving of the capital. That just means they may require some support. Right. Mark, so, uh, just, uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt your flow, but you know it's very important to to to, to build on the point that that Andina is making about support, about non-financial issues. Okay, and so you know part of our dream is to put together this thing called the SME marketplace, for want of a better description, where our SME investee companies start thinking about each other and start working together and start. You know, we, we, we're going to have an app where you can do your e-commerce uh, together as an SME community, where you can buy from one another, where you can, if you all need to buy paper, let's buy it in bulk together. You know, let's, let's start creating the missing elements between the informal and formal economy, which is the ability to buy in bulk, the ability to contract long term, the ability to benefit from economies of scale and purchasing power and have valid supply contracts, because the trouble in our country is that the poorest people have the highest cost per unit of consumption. Okay, so the, the cost of a cigarette or an apple or a, a minute of airtime for the poorest person is the highest because they can't contract because they don't have economic substance to contract. What we will create here in the, in the, in the, at the outset, before we create economic substance, will be the prospect of economic dignity and the desire to put energy into that prospect because it's real and you can feed it. And that builds and, and starts creating a, you know, a community. And all of the partners here come together. Arena, the media house is one of our partners. You've seen the sort of media coverage that we're able to give to the fund. Imagine a small Port Elizabeth based industrial company getting on the back page of the Sunday Times or the front page of the Sunday Times, because we see that as part of the capital that we bring to those entities which otherwise don't have access to it. And it's that and mentoring and all of these other elements, these invisible elements, these non-cash elements, this society, this ecosystem, which, and I'm finishing off now, <laughs> makes this eventually an attractive asset class. This is not just for the SMEs. I would argue, and Fatima's pointed out, pointed out, the mature capital markets, if anything, are probably overvalued. There's more capital chasing less uh, you know, energy. Take some of that money and put it into the real growth engine, and now we're talking. The first question I'm going to ask, and I think it's a question that's just recurring as I'm looking through my live chat, and it has to do with um, you know, the kind of lending rates that are out there in terms of uh, funding for entrepreneurs. And I think, Sean, let's get to, with you uh, for that one. When you look at the different interest rates that are out there, I mean, um, how excessive and I suppose call it even damaging to certain um, businesses' margins is it uh, if you were to consider funding? It's, it's a, we often talk about funding in this small segment and as being destructive. And let me just describe why it is destructive. And I'm, please don't get me wrong that I'm, I'm not saying there hasn't been a time and a place and a need. And people always think I'm bashing these people, but I really, I just want to point out some facts. I mean, there's presently a service. I got an email this morning from a company which are marketing services saying, if you are supplying the following 65 companies and you have a purchase order, I will lend you the equivalent value of your purchase order. The cost of that, though, is 6% of the purchase order value. So I have SME have to give up 6% of that invoice value to have financing for, what, 60 days. So for two months, I'm paying 6%. If you multiply that by the 6, I mean, automatically it's a 36% average rate per year that I'm paying in that finance. But more importantly is what is the margin on that invoice for this SME? He might have done his pricing and his costing, and perhaps he's making a 20% margin. But immediately, you've taken 6% of his margin off the top. And effectively, it means you've taken 30% of his profitability, just providing him some short-term finance. And somebody should never be that desperate that they have to ultimately sacrifice that much of their business for a short period of financing. That's an example of what I'm talking about in the context. There's, there's a need for it, but the need is, is incorrectly priced. That same finance could easily have been provided at a lower rate, but because there's no competition or there's no alternative for the SMEs, they're forced to use it, and it's, I think it's ultimately becoming exploitative. So there's many examples of this. I mean, right? I mean, pretty standard rates at the moment are 36% per annum financing cost for an SME on most services. You can go out onto the marketplace now, look at lots of these online funding portals, and if someone wants to borrow 1.5 million and less 
they'll pay about 36 percent per annum that for me is destructive to the profitability of the sme and it's destructive in his ability to achieve employment how can someone employ and grow when almost all of their margin is going to the cost of their finance so finance has to be two things it has to be patient that finance is not patient that is a six-month finance game. You don't pay it, you close it down. Effectively, finance has to have a degree of patience, which means you have to be able to finance at a low interest rate, low cash flow impact, but be prepared to wait for some equity-based return. So when we were talking about the portion of our fund being impact capital, we're talking about something priced at CPI or consumer price index effectively, which is, which is really, if a company cannot afford to finance and pay interest at CPI, it's in the wrong part of its business. So we need to help them also be in the right business to be able to afford this kind of finance. And then, you know, participate in them when they grow is give them the ability to use that breathing space to actually grow their business and then share a little bit of that breathing space with us so we can take a bit of that sharing and give it to the next guy who's coming in the chain. And in that way, we can build this up and build it up. We don't have to milk all of that cash flow out of the fund at the right time. So I give you, an, it's, it's all dependent on the companies that you are in and you have people must be careful about what the real cost of their finance is, the real cost of their finance, the origination fee, the admin charges, the, and those are what eventually your catch SMEs of God completely. Right. Um, Andila, we're going to come to you for this one. And I'm, I'm listening to some of the terms that Sean's, um, you know, uh, throwing out there. There are some SMEs out there that may not necessarily understand. And, you know, we call it financial education from a personal perspective sometimes when we're discussing uh, financial inclusion, etc. But when we're talking financial education from a business perspective, being able to understand um, the terms and conditions that are put in front of you when you're taking that loan, when you're considering that loan, is there a, a bit of a gap still or is, it, is the gap wide in terms of what businesses know and, and know in terms of what questions do I ask the person giving me the money? Absolutely, Tash. I, you know, right now, um, one of the initiatives we run is called and we are doing some supply development work for one of the big multinationals uh, here in South Africa. And um, we ran a program called the Advisory Boards Program where we would have people like the people on this panel serve as advisory board members to SMEs that are suppliers to the multinational. And I can tell you um, the one consistent lack of skill is not, let's call it the ability to render the service, right? So many of them are technically astute. So if I'm running a, an engineering business, I know how to do civil engineering work. If I'm running a tech business, I know how to do that. If I'm supplying equipment, I know how to do that. One consistent skill that's missing is the financial management skills. Um, the guys just have not developed it over time. And number, and number two, um, finance is the language of business. That is, if, if you don't understand finance, you won't be able to follow a business conversation. So a lot of them, their conversation stops at margin, right? I buy it 100 rand, I sell it 120. I'm making 20 rand. Well, to Sean's point, they don't think about the cost. They don't think about the real cost. They don't think about annualized cost. They don't think about just how abused they are because they've been abused for so long, Tash, they don't even know what love looks like anymore. So they don't yeah. know how many presents right. they deserve because they've been punished so long because this is where they come from. So 100% on point, biggest missing skill, financial management, finance, especially when raising capital. And that is something we have to teach. And, 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 and you know, it, it goes back to the whole question of, are we gonna solve the problems we have or are we gonna solve the problems we wish we had? We're not the US, we're not the UK. Our people need education. So you can set up all the online platforms you want. You can set up all of the funding capital you want. If you're not holding the hands and helping them appreciate how to run a business, just generally what are the things to look forward to or to look out for, chances are you're going to have underperforming loans. And not because they want to, just simply because they don't have the skills. So the element and kind of my input into the Kisby Fund is to keep us honest in making sure we're creating an A to Z support structure for all the SMEs. And then to Mark's point, creating a marketplace for them to trade between themselves. Because you see, if I'm trading with you, Tash, and we're part of the Kismi platform, it's the easiest thing for Kismi to lend me money to trade with you. Because you are essentially in the same circle. And Evan, isn't that how dynasties are built? Isn't that how communities are built? Aren't the richest uh, nations around the world built on trading amongst themselves?
Right. Fatima, Mark was talking about, uh, you know, capital sort of circulating in the same areas. And I think we see it now. I'm, I'm currently in, in Parktown, but a little further up north, there are massive skyscrapers and the capital always seems to be circling around there as opposed to over the highway where there's potential businesses uh, in the township areas that you could stimulate, you could help. And we can have conferences year in and year out about why banks don't want to finance small businesses or why they you know necessarily picky about it where is the disconnect is it a sense where the banks don't understand the township businesses where there could be a potential uh, you know uh, employment generator there or what exactly is the issue from your side and some of the conversations you're having I mean, I'm going to come in with a very controversial uh, uh, angle to this. And of course, it's my pet subject, which is trying to actually uh, uh, drive financial inclusion in South Africa and reduce uh, the concentration of our system that historically hasn't really moved in the post-apartheid environment. You know, we've got a couple of big players that control the economy and they continue to do that in, in the savings and investments uh, sector. And we need to find the mechanisms to include and bring about financial inclusivity as well as transform the sector. Because as you've said, the bulk of the jobs are created in the township economies. Listed companies are not creating the jobs. And in fact, over the past 10 years, uh, a lot of the capital and the cash on the balance sheet has not been deployed into um, innovative projects that can lead to job creation. They've been sitting with that money on the balance sheet uh, with the excuse that there's no policy certainty in South Africa and therefore we are scared to invest in the real economy and therefore uh, there haven't been sufficient jobs that have been created out of these companies. Now what we need is we need the regulatory environment to work together to achieve the future growth potential that we're looking at. So one, um, I think there's a step in the right direction. Uh, so our presidency has recognized that the current laws that, uh, uh, that, that limits the flow of investment capital into things like SMME funds, et cetera, need to change. And you'll, you'll, you'll know that uh, uh, Tito Mboweni, our finance minister, uh, had a little bit of a blurb two weeks ago when he, when he announced the, uh, the revised COVID budget and he spoke about uh, the Pension Funds Act in Regulation 28. And he said, well, something was missing in my speech. What happened to this part? Because he was going to make a very, very important announcement because the current rules prescribe limits in terms of how retirement funds can invest. And the limitations to invest in things like SMME funds, et cetera, is limited by the regulations. So I think to allow us to move forward, we need to overhaul the regulatory environment, but we also need to revisit triple BE legislation because what's been happening all this time is the allocation towards things like enterprise development, enterprise supply development, creating this ecosystem of downstream procurement has not really worked. You know, um, you can really create that ecosystem if downstream procurement works. So uh, uh, procurement policies, et cetera, have not efficiently uh, been utilized and optimized in the spirit of triple BEE legislation. And therefore, uh, I'm saying we've got to look at um, the retirement fund legislation. We've got to look at triple BEE legislation. And we've also got to look at collective investment scheme legislation. We've got 1,600 registered unit trusts in South Africa that's made up of 2.6 trillion rands of assets and not a single unit trust can invest in the KISB fund. And, you know, it's, it's unbelievable that we have this legislation that actually prohibits the growth and development of our economy. And we need to revisit this legislation. Okay, then allow me to be controversial here. And Mark, I'm going to come to you. We often talk right. about <laughs> we often talk about uh, red tape, and most entrepreneurs bring up the same issues. If we're all hearing it, we hear the complaints. We can write as many reports as we like about the same issues. From your side, I mean, when some of the things you may note, maybe noticing, 
why are we not fixing this red tape? Like, I mean, we can be talking about the ease of doing business, the ease of opening up a business and starting one. And if the same issues are being flagged year in and year out by entrepreneurs, where is the, the hindrance in being able to iron out those issues and make it easy for our entrepreneurs to start business and, and get to the point where they're thriving? Short-sighted stupidity. That's what it is. Okay. Uh, you know, if, if you think that we are going to try and take capital away from established circulating capital because we're not going to get, give them a better return, you're wrong. We're going to give them a better return. Okay? They're going to make more money. And th there's so many virtuous circles that need to be pursued. For example, say now the UIF were to invest in, in a thing like this. Well, every time we create a job, they get a contribution. Uh, you know, and, and, and say now we create tax base. Should the government support an initiative like this? Oh, Yes. Because every time we create tax base, they get a 38% return out of what we built. Okay? And so there are all these virtuous, economic, obvious circles which have been ignored. It's a little bit like if you find a vaccine for COVID, but you keep it within the hospital. Okay? And you never let it out into the public for the patients. That's what's happening. Capital, capital is circulating where capital already lives. Okay? And it's just silly. And what you're going to end up with is overpriced, low-yielding assets where there's a feast out there of people who are building real things. And, and let me just say this. When we reflect back on this in five years' time, we would have created an economic class and an economic ecosystem which, which is virtuous and has delivered extraordinary returns. And it'll just make us all feel better and we will have less to worry about in terms of measures than we will have about the reality of our lives. I mean, I can't tell you how obvious it is to me that you would do better putting money into a growing business in Alexander or Dipsford or Kyle Litcher, or and I, I only chose one of them once and I got into so much trouble. In all of those places, okay, <laughs> then you would getting a return out of another building in Santa. We should know this. And besides that, you know, the inequality that prevails if it is not solved if there is no middle ground there'll be no survival economically for anybody okay so this is urgent but profitable and i i just don't get why 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 established capital doesn't want doesn't want to do this because it's it's based on the numbers and it's it's just getting the right mix together right so there's so many questions that are coming in and i think a lot of them have to do with uh, you know wanting that uh, that funding because there's so many funds that have been uh, launched since the beginning of uh, you know trying to deal with the COVID pandemic sean before i get to some of the questions um, as they continue to flood through if someone were to ask what makes this one this kisby fund different from any other funds that have been launched since march 27th what would you say Blended capital is an important point. Blended capital that has both a, a long-term patient equity view and an understanding of that SMEs need to survive with the appropriate interest rates. Fundamentally, those are the structuring points. The other side of it, also blended companies that we can service through blended platform. We have great technology expertise, so we can deliver to the smallest of the small SME, but we also have fantastic investment and private equity expertise so we can deal with that SME that needs 50 to 60 million. We can deal with someone who needs 500 and we can deal with someone who needs 60. That is unusual. No other group of grouping of people has the ability in one fund to talk to you like that. And because we have that diversity of who we can fund, we have the ability to do the diversity and spread of our risk, therefore have this promised return to the equity holders that we're talking about and the investment holders. Mark, but I think it's also important to, to, to raise, sorry for coming in there, is, you know, the platform, the 4AX platform, this is a registered stock exchange in the market, which makes it uniquely different in the sense that no other SMME is going to operate on a, 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 a stock exchange. Yeah. I think it's a few things. We, we have a, our service is provided by 4AX Debt Services, which technically is a subsidiary of 4AX. But yes, our idea is to take that journey that Andelia is talking through, give someone the debt, give them the finance from 4AX debt services and then move them when they're appropriately ready and educated and did exactly what you're saying onto the emerging part of that 4AX stock exchange and then take them even further to the capital. So we understand the capital need of an SME throughout his life 
And we hope to be able to, in one environment, be able to provide it. Small debt, larger debt, small listing, private listing, big listing, growth international. If you think about it, have that under one roof is extremely unique in this context. I mean, that's I mean, why... Sorry, I'm, I'm coming in again, but we've been talking about township exchanges for so many years. Uh, you know, uh, it's been the topic of discussion all the time, ministers, governments, etc. And Sean, wouldn't you also say that this is a good, great example of moving towards that, that township exchange environment where small businesses eventually get an opportunity to be part of that? Well, the, the original founder or, or the original CEO of 4AX, Faye McCudden, she used to start every meeting off with, yes, I am a registered stock exchange, but I'm also going to serve as a township market and I am going to build a township exchange. So yes, the shareholders and fundamental parties were originally invested into the long and audious process of creating a new exchange, wanted that township view, they wanted that SME view, and they wanted the ability to bring capital. There are some realities, guys, we understand this. We have to protect, we have to grow, we have to protect individuals, we have to govern but we still have to move the capital points. You so see, we as we get this right, as we get this right, we're going to stop talking about township economies right? and township businesses. We're going to talk about businesses and economies. You know, we're going to move away from these labels because we, what we're going to do is look at the business and the people that are running it without any other conditions. Does it, does it behave well? Does it have a record? Are the enthusiastic skills involved? Let's invest. It's that simple. And then, as you say, you migrate. So the, the debt instruments can be listed on 4AX. So we can trade. We can have a commercial paper program. These are all big business words, okay? And then, you know, what are we going to do with this piece of equity that we get because we've stood patiently by them, watching them grow? Well, we're going to list it on 4AX and it can be traded. And that, and that can be the step towards the more mature capital markets. And we'll, we, we're going to let them go once they grow, okay? Let them go. And they will go into their own capital markets and the next crowd will come in. I mean, it's to me clear and obvious that we've got to move away from the sectorial understanding and mindsets about the different sectors and different, you know, demographics and all of those kinds of things. Let's just invest in real people doing business with one another. Let's just do that. Okay. <laughs> and, we, and, and, and then we will create this extraordinary, imagine it, man. Can, can you not see it? Well, everyone's <laughs> going to work just because they want to go to work, not because someone threw them a, a set of rules that enabled them to go to work. No, man, it's because I'm going to sow this and I can do it. At, well, let's give you some money and instead of saying it by hand, you can buy some sewing machine. It's just logic. There's nothing else. It's just where would you put your money? That's where I'd put mine. Mark, who's funding this? I mean, where's the money going to come from for this fund in order for it to build and to do the work and the vision that you have in mind? Well, we, we, we just involved now with our, with our, our capital raise. My, my, my expectation is that we'll get some institutional anchors that could be DFIs or major players in the capital markets, okay? because there is a circular virtue there that I talked about. Uh, you know, we, we don't, I think we might even get some sort of, if I might call it sympathetic capital, some sort of development capital players. But I actually think we're going to get money from real owners of established capital who see this as a new asset class. I think we've created access to an asset class that they don't typically have access to. They buy listed shares and bonds. I mean, get a life. Okay. And so, you know, and so I think we're going to approach all forms of established capital and we're going to present to them what they already know about, but in a properly risk adjusted, properly overseen, properly experienced, uh, you know, investment committee hands. And so I think we'll get three or four major anchor investors, big institutions. I don't want to name them, but we're already talking to them. We might get a, a, a selection of uh, uh you know of, of of smaller capital and then you know if fatima's uh, wishes come true in the regulatory space then everyone will come into it and and you know there are lots of players out there and 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 we welcome that the, the more sensible the more obvious the more normal we make it to invest in real business the, the better it will serve us all we want we want everyone to invest in this asset class we don't want to own it we just want to have a piece of it 
okay, so that we can, you know, if, if, if established business doesn't support growing business, they're going to run out of customers, man. Okay. And so, and I, you know, yeah, sorry, I also want to come in there because I want to talk about this perception of risk. You know, uh, uh, people talk about this perception of risk, like small businesses are riskier. Don't forget that the 16th largest share by market capitalization lost 300 billion rands of ordinary people's savings. That was sign off, you know. So this perception of risk is really an unfounded perception. And we must rethink what this perception of risk versus return is when we're making investments. I've got to make another point. I mean, between Fatima and I, we're going to interrupt a lot, okay? One of the points is this. One of the points I'm going to make is this. It's trust. Okay. So people talk about risk. How can we give money to these people? You know? Well, you know, I could use bad language, but I'm not going to. If, if you want, imagine you walk into the small business, which has never been able to raise properly priced capital. And you say, I'm going to give you some properly priced price capital. Do you think you're going to get the loyalty and energy and dedication of that person or not? You are. Trust people and they'll prove to be trustworthy. Give them an opportunity and they will take it. Don't and they won't. Okay? So we've of, got to bridge all of these divides. Sorry. Sis. Now I was going to say, speaking of people who want to take this opportunity because they're very excited based on some of the comments that are coming in, I want to make the responses that you provide to the viewers as informative as possible. So I'm going to ask a question and whoever wants to take that question, you can. And if there's anybody in the panel who feels like you want to add on in terms of your answer to enhance it and give it a little bit more meat and make it far more enriching for the viewers that is perfect the first question that comes through and I think Mark you should take this one um, is what criteria are you looking for what kind of businesses will this fund be looking to invest in okay so we, we we had a long discussion about this yesterday and we continue to, to to revise our thoughts but you know if you said to me what's a what would, what would be in the sweet spot well it might be a company that's got 10 or more million turnover that's got kind of a net margin of of of, of 20% that's uh, you know that's employing you know a minimum of 10 or more people okay and 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 that's that that has got a demand driven strategy where they could sell more if they could finance more or if they could cross the economies of scale divide by buying a machine instead of uh, you know, whatever and there's there's all of those balancing factors i don't know i don't know what we're going to end up with. But I'll, I'll tell you this, we've got the technology to sift through and do a whole lot of little stuff driven by almost AI kind of thinking. And then out of that will occasionally emerge big companies where we're going to lend them 50 million or more, okay, on the basis that we've looked at their you know, EBITDA, the earnings before interest and tax and depreciation, and we've said, how much can this thing bear? And then we go to the mix. And I think that the maturity profile is the issue. You know, in two years' time, we might find a few more Facebooks and what all those things in there, and those things we're going to release into the market, and we're going to start drawing capital, drawing capital into them. I, 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 you know, we have a very clear idea. You must employ people. You must have a business that has got some kind of track record and evidence demand. And you, you must. There must be. It must be clear that the only thing you're really missing is capital. That you know what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, I don't think we'll go too small. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, Sean, help me. Oh, you know this stuff. No, no, I mean, I'm, I've got much more specifics than Mark, but Mark likes to have it a little bit vague, so he doesn't want to give away all the secret sauce. But, yes. But get I specific. Mean, get specific, Sean. So the simple reality is that as a fund, you have to also protect your investors' money, correct? So people are putting money in us. They're making sure we have to look after it and we have to. So the fundamental that Mark spoke about is the business has to have existing appetite and can do something with the capital. In other words, existing customers, existing revenue, some degree of profit. It doesn't have to be exactly profitable today, but a path to profitability that is clear, visible, and direct, so that we understand what it is. The ability to absorb our, our capital is one thing, so people must never be owned, overburdened by the capital. People think they need capital, but sometimes they realize that capital can be overburdened shipped in this context. So if I was to really give you a 20% of our fund is ultimately going to go to potentially towards companies that are less than 15 million rand turnover, but 80% of the money will go to funds that are bigger than 15 million rand turnover. 
that context. This is a broad spectrum. But this blend of capital is important as well that Mark talks about, is that we are prepared to take a, a view where we sacrifice some interest in people for a view of the upside and the economics of that company, in other words, the equity of that company's growth. But largely, that will be in companies which are on the sort of higher differential side of our scale. But, we, but because of the technology, we are able to do lots of little loans as well, Sean. Yeah. So, sorry, what I mean is that at least, but when I say a portion of our capital, we're talking about still to do, to spend 200 million on loans that are between 500,000 and a million, that's a lot of loans, effectively. But it just represents in our context only 20% of the capital that we utilize from a risk point of view. So yes, we will deal with loan sizes that are, are really based on the ability for someone to pay it off within the three-year period of time. So if you can work that out, you know, the loans would be companies that have more than a million rand turnover for sure. We're not going to lend to anybody who doesn't have less than, a million, has less than a million rand turnover. None of our loans will be less than 250,000 rand, that's for sure. And then from there onwards, we scale with the company as we scale. Mark referred to our deal sweet spot. The middle company would be someone who's 15 million rand turnover, uh, effectively taking a 5 million rand loan because they have about a 2 million rand EBITDA. That's an ideal company for us. That, that's what it fits the middle. But there, as Mark says, there's going to be to the right and there's going to obviously be to the left. Of that. Yeah, but we also, so we're not going to build a new mine. You know, capital intensity is not what we're about. And we're not going to look at, uh, you know, um, complete venture capital. And there's some guy in Stellenbosch has just found a cure to COVID, in which case you'll throw a bit of money at that. But, but the combination of an objective uh, filter to the, through the application process, which is online, that delivers potential target uh, investee companies. We then apply brains and experience to the final composition of what should go into those companies, having listened to them and thought to, and, and brought to bear all of the experience around here. So there's like a two two step process. And I don't think we eliminate uh, you know any particular set of numbers. What we might eliminate is something which is clearly capital intensive or something which is just a dream. Uh, you know, or something which shows no prospect of growth and employment. You know, I, I, but, you know, to answer your question, the final investment profile of this company is going to be a function of the demand that's out there and the capacity to understand it that's in here. Right. The next question says, are you using the same formula that Tusk, Business Partners, Cedar, and Nurture use? I don't know if anyone is familiar with those formulas that those particular companies use. Oh, never heard of them. <laughs> and Julia would. I, mean, I, 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 know, um, I think, I don't know all of the internal formulas whatsoever. You know, business, and I, can, I can mention Business Partners for one. You know, Business Partners is a very established lender. They've lent 19 billion rand. 75,000 companies, they take an approach of patient capital. Yes, they are pioneering the space for sure. And we never yeah. see ourselves competitive in this context. We are additive. We've got some added, we perhaps have more technology driven as well, so we can perhaps do more lending than they may be able to do. We've got the benefit of 4X, we've got the benefit of the private equity, a deep private equity focus. We've got also this, this ecosystem approach where we have the Rena group effectively, which is an amazing group to help each of our companies promote and expand. So we really, Mark refers to it as a, an integrated ecosystem of parts. And that's the only way funding in this SME segment works. You can't just do, you've got to have education, opportunity, finance, trade, we put those things together. So in that context, we don't think that we are formulaic is what they might say. The question was, are you using the same formula? Those companies have been successful in their lending. We're definitely different to see that you know, in that context. We're not completely wholesale, we're not completely development capital in this context. But you know, they may be a funder. They, they are a wholesale capital provider in their times. So business partners has been very good and they've been very good in their approach. So you know, they've been very, very successful as well and we understand that. But we hope to be similar and more and cooperative with them as well. But also, just to add to what Sean is saying, Taj, you know, all of these players exist in a market that still remains dissatisfied. That's the truth. And add to that, by the way, the banks. Um, the banks are also there. They are also lending to small businesses. So if you take all of the biggest banks, you take up all these third party players, and they do it the way they do it, and they still are able to report um, them lending to small businesses, a big gap that tells you that the demand of this economy 
is not in the high-rise buildings or centers. The demands, support, of, and growth of this economy is in what we've con constantly been neglecting, as we've repeatedly said. So no, we are probably going to compete with many, but we have our own juice, we have our own style, and we have our own swagger. Right. The next question says, will you be willing to help small startups that are starting by, or are you looking for well-established business? And the short answer to that is, is no. Venture capital, early stage startup funding isn't the target. To, to Sean's already raised point, we're raising capital from the markets and we need to lend it responsibly. What we are really looking for is that sweet spot. So you already have a business going, you've been running for a while, you're making around 10 million rand, 50 million rand revenue. Yes, the bare minimum is one, but you know, you've got a few employees, you've got great clients, what are you looking for? You're looking for growth. Um, maybe you're looking for, for some equipment. Uh, maybe you're looking to support, to be able to, to manufacture more, to support the demand you're getting. Um, or you need to be looking for some support during a difficult period where, you know, there's some delays between your orders and your, and your cash flow. Pure kind of, you know, working capital funding. So the sweet spot and the desire is to fund small businesses. So I have to have a business. I have to have an operation with customers that pay me regularly. And I have people that manufacture or provide a service to those customers that I pay regularly. So that, that's the sweet spot. Uh, I can just jump in here as well. Sure. Thanks the question. I mean, a lot of these questions we get about who and who and how we're going to approach it, how we're going to lend so much money, what are partnerships. We've been doing this for a long time in a, in a way. There are so many opportunities for us to create value added partnerships with people who are touching entrepreneurs. If we look and you, and you mentioned Fatima about, you know, the supplier development programs that corporates have corporates at the moment have for the last five years had a focus on lending some of their money and other money to the suppliers in their supply chain. We've been talking to a lot of those corporates who just don't have enough capital to meet the demand in that whole supply chain that they're talking to from their own enterprise development points. There is a lot of ability for us to be co work with people like that. We can actually bring these companies to us that are in these various stages too. So there's various avenues of getting to it. There's various models that we've built around expanding the growth, being able to scale our approach to deal with so many SMEs in the type of intensity that we've been discussing. So often someone raises the question with us, how are you going to help so many people? How are you going to deploy 5 billion at Two, two million rand loans to so many people in so many years. It's all about collaboration. It's all about working with various partners, working with technology, and working with your investment structures. The next question says, can you please explain the fees and equity that your management team will earn? That's so what you think? You're going to leave that to me, huh? Okay, that's cool. So, I mean, I don't want to get into precise numbers here, but... Uh, I, you know, they'll be raising fees, and I think they're only, uh, between 1% and 2%, depending on the nature of capital and who's participated in that, in that capital raising. There are, um, there are uh, operational expenses to be covered. There are, um, but to, to give you an example, to, to sort of wrap it up into an example, our, our lending rate for the senior debt is, uh, ends up at about 19.75%, and our base rate that we offer to investors is sort of prime plus two, and so if you if, if if you look at our rate as being sort of prime plus six, if you like, to get our risk profile right, and then there's three or four percent of costs which get wrapped into that. All of that comes in at six or seven or, or more percent below uh, the lowest rate that you can get out in the marketplace at the moment. So, and we can talk about how that how those fees get staggered and how those you know how those fees get earned as you go and all of those kinds of things. But of course, a fund like this has costs, and the and the technology has costs, and those will be completely transparent, uh, completely transparent to the investors and to the users of the capital. Fatima, I think this one is for you. Um, there are two questions that I'm going to merge into one because they pretty much try to allude to the same thing. Uh, basically, um, what changes would you like to see in triple BEE codes, if any? I think uh, the triple B codes, uh, and in fact, I'm on the FSTC council, so uh, I've got to be careful what they say. Uh, having said that, 
you know, if, if we look at the, uh, the DTI codes, um, they, they deal with every specific element that is required to facilitate financial inclusion. But I think that the codes uh, are, one, open to abuse by players in the market, um, and two, they're also open to manipulation in the market. Uh, at the end of the day, the emphasis must be on uh, broad participation of all in the economy, which has been said over and over and over again um, in this, this session that we've had. Financial inclusion, participation by all in the, in the economy, and ensuring that market access exists. Um, and I think that the codes, uh, particularly our code at the moment, the financial sector code, is going through its review process. Um, after its review process, it will be submitted uh, as a DTI for uh, uh, being uh, gazetted at the end of the day. Uh, having said that, this review process is uh, dealing with all of these issues that have been raised in the market around some of the shortcomings uh, of the code as well as the, how we can make it easier. Uh, uh, my view is that the code in its current form is incredibly complex, and I think we've got to find the mechanisms to simplify the code and make them more effective. Um, and, and hopefully through that process, we'd be able to deal with some of the weaknesses. So uh, I want to give a succinct summary on that issue of costs. I mean, if you distill it, we're looking at something like 2% of initiation costs and about a 3.5% per annum of assets under management, if, if that gives you the, you know, the proper numbers. All right, this one is for anyone who wants to take it. Maybe you are aware of some of these initiatives. It says, are South Africa's DFI's funding initiatives created to handle blended capital solutions? And if not, why not? So, I mean, I can come in there. I mean, yeah. going, I think, uh, you know, a blended finance has worked phenomenally well in other economies. Um, as well as uh, the OECD. I mean, there's a lot of research that has been written on it. Uh, and I think the future for investment uh, in South Africa is about blended finance, is about bringing together DFI capital, foreign direct investment, private sector capital, retirement fund capital, savings uh, uh, stocks, and, and, you know, collectively uh, a bit in this asset class as, uh, as market. So, I mean, just take the President's Infrastructure Development Initiative, which I think is fantastic, you know, because, you know, we've got these very efficient capital markets where foreigners play, but they buy and sell, they don't invest, okay? So, if you're building a dam, you know, you, you're creating an asset which no one can take away when it's finished. Okay? But, that, but that infrastructure development requires extraordinary supply chains and, and the people that, that feed into it. We would like to be able to fund the, the real economy that 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 feeds in to the strategic forward capital investment structures of our uh, you know uh, that that are being presented and so we want to make sure that that when you build a dam all of the smes our smes our people can become part of that economic project and and grow to be big enough to become part of the next economic project and so you know i think that there is a huge intersection between what dfi funding and pension funds are funding and what the government is looking at funding and being the provider of those services and employing the people that feed into those more you know those macro uh, economic initiatives and that's who we need to fund right the next question can, yeah you sorry, can I continue just, i just like to add some and you know one of the reasons we had the golden era of foreign direct investment in south africa and um, the problem we're faced with right now, and that's part of the role of the infrastructure office of the presidency, is to package these solutions to make them investment friendly. Um, and, you know, in our little way, as part of the Kisby Fund, is also about packaging um, attractive investment solutions to making them investment so investors can feel comfortable in supporting, because there must be trust in the system. If there's no trust in the system, nobody is going to want to invest. And it's about the, how we package it, how we uh, uh, ensure that we deliver against um, the underlying uh, impact investment attributes of the solution. 
The next question reads, um, your website says senior loans are priced at 19.75%, which is 12.5% above prime, seems expensive. Who wants to clarify that? Is it expensive in relation to what's out there right now? Um, we can give you we can give you the makeup of that. Yes, it is prime plus twelve and a half percent. Built into those numbers are assumed default rates. We're going to have bad debts. We're going to have non-performing loans. Um, we, we're looking at the term loan structure, which is somewhere between twelve and thirty-six months. So it's a twenty-four month loan. And I must tell you that I don't regard uh, nineteen point seven five as expensive relative to the current market price for such loans. And you should bear in mind also that that will be a portion of the funding that is applied to your business. You've got to look at the blended cost of capital. So the, 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 the CPI linked loan will have an all in cost of 7%. Where can you get money at that rate? Uh, which has got, which will of course then have an equity piece that we can factor into our, our total return. Uh, you know, so I don't think that that's expensive for the risk profile. We have to factor into, into our equation and we have to survive. So from an investor's perspective, you have to have a sufficient buffer in, in, in order for some things to go wrong so that you can keep the momentum and sustainability of the fund. So, you know, I mean, market price is determined where market price finds itself and where sustainable continuity survives. And, uh, you know, I can tell you that the all in costs for these kinds of loans are upwards of 40 percent. So 19.75, take the money. Uh, Andila, I don't know, you might want to tackle this one. It says, um, what can we do about market concentration and the shutting out of uh, small businesses? Oh, don't get me started <laughs> on that. That's, that's the cancer of our economy that keeps entrepreneurs out. We have an economy... We, we, should, we should all log off now and leave Andila for a while. <laughs> we have an economy that... I think, I think the person who's asking the question obviously knows, but for other viewers at home, the question is really around the fact that in almost every industry in our country, there's a handful of players that control 80% of activity in that industry. You look at telco, you look at banking, you look at even mining companies. In almost every specific resource, there's, there's, there's big players. And that's the nature of the economy of South Africa, what they call the, the, the... The short answer is, there's never been a time in my working life, thanks to COVID, by the way, that no one tells me, sorry, Andile, we're not interested in your proposition. We're not interested in your pitch because we've always done it. For the first time in my working life, Tash, people actually have to listen to ideas that entrepreneurs have. Because one of the answers, COVID-19 has flipped the script on everybody. So the short answer I would give to entrepreneurs out there is to say, um, COVID-19 is obviously a horrible pandemic because it's a, it's a, it's a humanitarian and health issue that's leading to people losing lives, right? We, we hit some numbers last night with all the headlines this morning of just how many people are infected with the virus and are dying. However, I've seen a very specific response by business, and that is an open-minded and, and a more receptive uh, kind of attitude to new ideas and solutions to problems. So if ever there was a time to knock on doors, it is now, because the structure of the economy is what it is. I'm not gonna change it. You know, it's almost like spatial planning in townships. I can't move Joburg CBD to Soweto. Soweto is going to remain in the outskirts of CBD. However, I can build a factory in Soweto. And I think what we can do with this kind of constant keep you out situation where the big guys only play with the big guys is now is the time to keep knocking on the doors because now they have to listen because they are confused. They too don't know what the solutions are. The next question reads, will this leverage uh, Section 12J tax benefits? We are not sure. Section 12J. No, it's not a section 12. Yeah, it's not a section 12. Great. And the next one says, can you connect um, companies with interested, well, with SMEs that are interested in um, enterprise development? That's a great question. And absolutely, we, we, you know, once we build the credibility. I'm glad you took that question because I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> First, Mark and Sean have to go and find the money. <laughs> And then Fatima and I will help them allocate it well. Um, but the minute, as soon as we get going and we get the traction of the fund and we are able to start showcasing what we're doing with the fund, every single multinational, and I know this because I service them, 
every single master national in their supply development program is looking for the entrepreneurs that are supplying them to also supply other bigger companies. Because you see, what typically used to happen at the very beginning of supply development, Tash, was that if I'm Coca-Cola, I would uh, get a supplier that supplies me, let's call it packaging, and he'd be my supplier. You know, he's my Andile, who supplies boxes only to Coke. Well, we've all now learned that actually the benefit for Coke is to make sure that that supplier is supplying everybody that's an FMCG manufacturer that needs packaging. He's also supplying AB and Bev. He's also supplying Tiger Brands. He's also supplying AVI. He's also supplying Unilever, et cetera, et cetera. So the supplier development program system is a very unique opportunity for us as a Kisby fund because we could, be, we could find one customer that may, that may supply only one multinational. The ability for us to use our profile, our credibility, the reach of our partner arena will, should give those entrepreneurs access to those other bigger clients who are looking for those black suppliers, those black women-owned suppliers as well. Yeah, I feel like I'm on Sunday and you're preaching on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sure, that well, I suppose this question then, uh, you know, allows you to be uh, front and center for now. And it's directed at you, actually. It says, how do we become lead provider to the fund, seeing that you're looking for partners? Well, we have the ability on the, I mean, on our website at the moment, on kidsbe.co.za, we've created a section where people can register as partners or as interested partners and just register there, let us know who it is. And yes, we are going to have these network partners as I'm dealing just described to work with people who are already working with entrepreneurs who can help us expand the capital and expand those entrepreneurs. Of course, we have to have that as well. And you'll remember a little bit earlier on, we were talking about, um, you know, having um, management, well, uh, information about how to understand your finances, understanding the different terms. And this question, I think, relates to that. It says, can we be clear about the difference between senior debt and equity funding? Sure. So senior debt is just plain vanilla loan. You've got a loan, which is a two-year loan. Uh, it amortizes over the two-year period and gets repaid in two years' time. And that loan typically uh, needs, as its character, predictable cash flows or security in the form of your debtor's book or whatever other assets and income-generating profiles you can put to, to bear against that. That's debt. That's normal, ordinary debt. The, the, the more interesting piece for us that makes it work is, 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 is a piece of yielding Debt at a lower, much lower servicing rate. So let's call it CPI plus something. Let's call that an all-in rate of 7%. But attached to that is an option for us as the fund to convert into equity and buy shares in your business, utilizing that capital. So you have a normal serviceable loan. Put that in a box. And, and that's dictated by the sort of metrics that Sean, that Sean was talking about. You've got a 15 million turnover. You, you, you're you making two or three million EBITDA. You can't borrow more than five million sustainably as debt. Okay. Um, then you've got this uh, lower yielding, uh, lower cost capital, but it seeks a higher return in due course. So in three or four or five years time, we converted at some point, which we thought was the best growth point of inflection in the business, we convert that piece of debt, which is say 20% of the total exposure to you, into shares in your company. You'd want to do that if we did that conversion at a price lower than what you could, what you could raise equity capital out in the marketplace. We then become partners. Okay. And so you've still got the debt, but we've got 20% of your company, whatever the, whatever the number could be. We then exit in due course by selling that or listing it on 4AX or whatever the case may be, and you become, if you will, a normal capitalized uh, company. I hope that helps understand. It, it's important for us to have that partnership, that protection. You know, I've always said, you know, lenders buy the food, but they never get invited to dinner. Equity guys come to the dinner. So we want to, we want to be able to do both of those things so that we can tolerate, uh, you know, growth and so that we can expand with you knowing that our reward is out there, but more. And just on that, if I'm, uh, you know, the whole model around private equity and the equity component of it is um, the, the, the part and the support that you provide 
to the management of the small businesses that allow them to grow. Uh, so often, you know, Andrea spoke about uh, sometimes these skills are lacking, uh, etc. And with the support of the equity funders, you also tend to uh, win a, a better balance in achieving some of those, uh, uh, you know, the advice or the direction on expanding the businesses. I mean, so we also, you know, we're providing knowledge transfer here. Okay. So if you look at the SME community that we will create, uh, they don't have to go on courses and that, because they've got a community which, which is vested interest in one another. And so you'll have a mentor. Okay? At 11 o'clock at night, you want to find the guy and say, listen, what can I do about factoring my debtors? Because I just need, I've got this opportunity. Like, and there are people who know the answer to that, which you can't find in a textbook. And there are people probably in the SME community that we create that might be on the other side of that deal. So, I, I, you know, th this is what's required, is a real conversation amongst real business people, you know, feeding off one another, building. We're going to build an entirely new middle ecosystem, which is the gap that we need to fill. The next question. Imagine if we, imagine if we don't do this. Are you going to fin are you, do you want to finish your point or should I continue? No, I'm finished. I'm finished. Imagine if we don't solve SMEs. Imagine if we don't create a middle. There's nothing to talk about. That's why I went quiet. It's very unusual for me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> the next question says, is this only for triple BEE investments? Uh, so the question is whether we're only funding black people? No. We are finding all South Africans. Yeah, we the people. It's the beginning of the Constitution. Okay, and so, but let me say this because it's an important point. We don't have selection criteria based on demographics. We have selection criteria based on business acumen, and energy, and uh, your your desire to be part of a growing economy. I bet you that in five years' time when we reflect on the SMEs that we enabled with our capital, we will find a perfect match between them and the demographic profile of South Africa. And that's the point. The point is, you, you know, it's kind of related to the point of us earlier on when we were talking about township businesses versus just businesses, right? Um, yes, it's important to distinguish, but sometimes it, it, the terminology enslaves us in that we don't see township-based businesses as real businesses, you know? They have to have an, a, a qualification called township. Um, they're businesses. They just happen to operate in the markets yeah. they do. So clients are clients. What we need to make sure of is that our clientele reflects the demographics of the country we serve. So for and me, I mean, the question shouldn't be about black or white or, or women or men. We should have, when we look at our book, it must talk to the demographics of South Africa, both gender and ordering. So that's Let our response. Who, who, who's building these businesses? Go and have a look. They don't need any rules. They are the natural force of economic ambition in our country. It's simple. It's obvious. The next question says, um, CIFA has a bad debt rate of 50% of its direct loan book. What are you budgeting for Kisby? Well, I can't comment on whether that question's right or wrong. I mean, I have no idea what CIFA's and someone making that statement, I don't know the validity of it. I can assume that some of that is high. And when we do, this is what Mark was referring to. When we have to do our pricing of our debt, we do have to assume that in this segment, we will have a higher default ratio than banks have traditionally had in theirs. Why? Because banks haven't funded. We, we had a whole hour conversation about, about the reason for that. What's important, though, is our return to our investors is to be able to stomach a bad debt return that you have in some of those loans because we have an equity component which can have more that comes on the other side. So yes, our models do have relatively high bad debt models built into them, but still our economics work for our investors because of the blended capital that we have. I want to give you an example. You know, in India, there was a bank, and I'm going back four years, so my daughter's not current. There was, there was a bank that started funding Stockfelds. They've got the equivalent of Stockfels. Yeah, they're just on a bigger scale. And uh, and for the first time, these co these collective saving schemes got given real risk capital. And the peer group review and the need to demonstrate that they can be trusted and that they are valid business people prevailed. 
and that book grew astronomically and the bad debt ratio was less than 2%. Now, I'm not saying we're going to go there, but I'm saying you can throw away the book of rules when you start creating an SME sub-economy. You can throw away, you know, the sort of standard uh, uh, bad debt ratios. And then the last comment is, if you're lending money at 40% to a business that's generating a 20% return, but you don't expect bad debts. The price is wrong. The mix is wrong. The tolerance is wrong. The encouragement is wrong. The partnership is missing. And we have to solve that. And it's like, you know, this thing gets a momentum of its own as people see the possibility. And, and more and more people start co-investing and understanding and creating this integrated business model, which, you know, is, is, is self uh, sustainable. Uh, it, uh, you know, I know everyone's looking at the rules of your to try and define the possibilities of the future. I don't see it that way. I see this as something that has not been solved yet. And we think that we've got the mix of, of skills and expertise and, and the right blend of capital to start solving it. We did an interesting, I mean, maybe I can just talk to you about something which is very specific and perhaps, you know, I mean, it's not confidential because it is ours. We did two types of lending at one point. We did an experiment. Okay? We lent 25 million rand to a diverse base of SMEs at an interest rate of 28% per annum. We lent another 25 million rand to, an, to a marketing base and we lent it out at 16% per annum. Okay? And we used primarily largely the same criteria for the evaluation of it. Now, which one of those books do you think performed better for us as an investor? Now, the interesting point is we lost money on the bigger book, the book that was charging the high interest rates. Now, the question is why? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? A company knows its worth. It knows what it should be paying. It knows more or less where to apply. And people were coming as a feeling of last resort, the law funder of last resort at the high interest rate, as opposed to when we were talking about 16, we got the choice people that came there because they knew that there was, and it was competitive to what the rate is. So if you're gonna launch a fund, price this product at the right place where the people who feel that they deserve a great interest rate apply, and you don't get people who think that they only deserve the high end yet. This comes to a needless abuse question. You don't feel like you're abused or whatever we had earlier. But I was completely amazed that if you treat people properly, lend them correctly, don't place their businesses under extreme pressure, you can get them to survive. But the margin no, is, this? If, you, if you squeeze them too early, they die. You know, desperate capital kills you. Yeah. You know, if, if you're desperate for money, you'll get it. But it won't, it won't, it won't heal you. And then uh, what so they do more. And then what they do, yeah. they then use that yeah. when, they, when, they, when they abuse the entrepreneurs by charging them too much. And then they use that to argue the point that Fatima was raising earlier. Oh, SMEs are more risky. Nonsense. Yeah. Nonsense. So you never gave me a chance from day one. Obviously, this was going to happen. And that's not sustainable because we're not going to solve our challenges. We've got a question here uh, talking about rural SMEs and SMEs in the townships. We've gotten a wealth of information and answers from all of you. The question now is, at the end of this discussion, at the end of this webinar, how do uh, SMEs in the townships, in the rural communities who have who've been doing really well, good track record, find out about you, know how to apply, and know all about the funding? Because most of the time, there's a lot of funding out there, but entrepreneurs don't know where to access it, how it all works, and how do we get the information from this webinar out into the streets? Just before somebody else answers, I think the one benefit of this solution is that it's backed by one of the biggest media houses in the country. And that media house is putting its backing behind creating awareness. And it has got a publication that services every element of the community, whether digitized or on paper, that uh, fits the national footprint. And I think to create an enormous amount of awareness. We've got about yeah, two, I mean, just, yeah. This is a, yeah. really put that in context. We have a 
just so we manage expectations. I don't get a lot of abuse of me on the website. So we are only going to be open for funding applications as of you know, the 15th of September from an application point of view. But on the website at the moment, there is the ability for someone to register their interest, give us their details, their mobile number, and we will then start communicating to them closer to the time exactly what those rules are. So they go to kisby.co.za at the moment. There's a place where you, as a borrower, you can register, give us your details, tell us about yourself, and then we'll start giving you tailored responses for that. And because you come there, we'll also give you a free one-month trial at any of the publications of Arena from a news point of view as well. Okay, we're See? running out of time. We've got a few seconds left. Sean, I'm going to stay with you for this particular question just so we can wrap it up. People want to know what is the turnaround time for applications? Yeah, so again, it depends on the application type. The short answer is we can do the smaller, more relevant loans in a short period of time. But when it comes to those more difficult equity-based loans, we are going to be at least you know, 72 to two weeks on some of those as well. So it, it's not a vanilla question. Sorry, I know they wanted one answer. They wanted a specific. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's dependent on the type of loan that you're doing and the amount that you're borrowing for. But we aim to be <laughs> faster. Yeah. Our, job, our job is to invest this money. It's in our interest to do it as fast as we reasonably but we're not going to be dispensing money before like end of September. So don't start the clock now if you're judging us. <laughs> Fatima, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I'm sure the viewers who've been watching have absolutely found it informative. And uh, we've managed to answer the, uh, most of your questions and deal with a lot of the issues in the SME landscape. But I'd like to thank uh, the panel once again, Mark Barnes, the executive chair of the Kisby SME Fund, Sean Amory, who is the CEO and co-founder of Rainfin, Fatima Vauda, the managing director of 27.4 Investment Managers, and Andila Kumalo, CEO of Kumalo Co. That's it for me. We'll be back uh, sometime soon to talk more about SME issues. And we'll also check up on the Kisby SME Fund when it is ready to get off the ground and help you to build your business. That's it for me. Goodbye.